Welcome, everyone, <laughs> to a very special edition of Writers Out Loud on Ukraine. My name is Lori Schubert. I'm the executive director of the Quebec Writers Federation, and we are especially excited and honored to have with us today four writers, three in Ukraine at the moment, uh, and one in Vancouver at the moment, um, to talk about the situation in Ukraine as they're perceiving it, experiencing it, living it, and also about their work uh, and Ukrainian literature in general. Um, we've had a little bit of drama already in the few minutes before we started the webinar in that there were air raid sirens in two of the cities where two of the participants are. So they've moved, uh, Bogdana and Yuri, you will see, have moved into uh, alternate um, locations. Their lighting is not so great, but we're amazed and thrilled that they are still able to be with us and in a safe place. So uh, welcome all of our panelists, welcome all of our audience. Um, we're just gonna start out very, very soon. I wanted to say that um, we will have time at the end for questions and you should use the Q&A uh, link uh, icon at the bottom of your screen to post your questions as they occur to you, if you like, and I will be passing those along to Kate, our host, uh, when the time comes. Uh, Kate Serkin is our wonderful moderator who helped organize this. I certainly could not have done it without her. She's an American writer, editor, and translator living in Ukraine and the co-founder of Apophany magazine. I'm just going to turn it right over to you, Kate, to, to take us on this uh, little bit of a journey. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. I just wanted to introduce our panelists very quickly for those who are not familiar with their work. Uh, Yuri Andruhovich has published several novels, poetry collections, uh, short stories, uh, as volumes of essays, as well as literary translations from English, German, Polish, and Russian. He is one of the most uh, famous and beloved writers of Ukrainian literature today. Uh, Norman Naroki is Montreal-based author, poet, playwright, and musician. Uh, much of his recent work focuses on the Ukrainian-Canadian immigrant experience. Uh, so he is representing Ukrainian diaspora for us today. And lastly, but uh, at least but not la uh, last but not least, uh, Bogdana Nebrak is the editor in chief at the Ukrainians. She is a cultural manager, uh, former director of the translation department at the Ukrainian Book Institute, and a podcast host. So, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, so I want to start with a rather maybe simple but important question for our viewers. Uh, could you tell me where were you when you realized the invasion had started uh, in Ukraine? Uh, Yuri, why don't you start? Mm, yeah, hello to everyone. And um, yes, I'm, I'm not very satisfied by, by the picture here. I see myself in a quite dark uh, atmosphere. Uh, but uh, I hope this air alarm that we uh, uh, that we experience uh, maybe for the one uh, hundred fiftieth time uh, that it it uh, will be over soon, and I can be back to my uh, working room where more, more, uh, where I have more light. Um, I was, I, I was sleeping actually in the night uh, on uh, 24th February. At the time I was awakened, um, it was uh, between six and seven o'clock in the morning. I was awakened by, by some uh, sounds of, uh, Mm, explosions. They were quite uh, strange. Uh, my my first uh, idea uh, was okay. It it should be quite all right because probably uh, it is uh, it is uh, the sound of. Uh, 
military place what we have um, in that um, area not not very far away from the city and probably this is ukrainian army which is exercising now uh, preparing itself uh, to the war because uh, i was at that time absolutely sure there will be a war but the question was uh which day it begins uh, which date of the beginning should we then uh, fix as, as a date of, of the beginning but it wasn't ukrainian army mm, it was a rocket attack uh, on our mm, airport uh, in, in the city of ivano frankivsk and uh, it was not very successful uh, because uh, all the military aircrafts uh, were um, somehow they were informed about this uh, attack uh, it was made in a way uh, that all the aircrafts were in the air already and no one of them uh, has been shot and as a result of this shooting was a big fire in the in the area of airport and uh, as i uh, went to my window and I had this uh, view uh, in the direction of our airport. It will be the very first my impression, my visual impression, because uh, my uh, audio impression was connected to, to these sounds of explosions. But what I've seen first uh, was the, the absolutely uh, black smoke. There was a lot of this black smoke, the, the blackest smoke I ever seen. <laughs> uh, I never saw such uh, intensity of black color. And it was the smoke uh, which uh, uh, was getting wider and wider and wider, uh, somehow uh, like uh, conquering the sky over the city and it, it was a huge uh, stripe of black smoke uh, which was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and so it it lasted for maybe two or three hours uh, the, 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 the special teams uh, were fighting the, the firefighters were uh, fighting against this uh, uh fire at the airport and uh, it was uh, finally liquidated and then uh, then we get a lot of news from everywhere from different parts of our country about uh, the full uh dimension of uh russian invasion there were the messages from north from east and from south and we are in the west of ukraine so we were shot but uh, we didn't uh, get some message about uh, about invasion because uh, we have here the the, the uh, closest border is the western border of ukraine so uh, there are the, the the countries of european union and nato so uh, each part of Ukraine, which uh, has some border to Russian territories, has been attacked on that day. And uh, Bogdan, I know you were originally based in Kyiv. Were you there when the invasion started or had you already made it to Lviv beforehand? Thanks, Kate, for this question, and uh, hello, everybody who's listening to us. Uh, when we 
Ruska invasion started, uh, uh, I was in Kyiv uh, together with my boyfriend and uh, I will remember well uh, that morning and that day. Uh, I usually wake up at 7 uh, o'clock, uh, so I, I woke up and uh, the night mode of my uh, cell phone uh, was uh, turned off. Uh, and I realized that uh, a lot of people uh, have called me, uh, my friends, uh, uh, also my relatives uh, and the relatives of my boyfriend. Uh, and uh, they all were trying to say me that the war started. But the first thing that I really saw at the screen of my phone was uh, the New York Times application. And it also stated uh, that the war started. Uh, I opened the news at New York Times and uh, I read uh, that uh, there was the rocket strike, the missile strike at uh, Brovare. It is really uh, close to Kyiv, uh, but uh, I uh, live uh, in the district of Podil. It is a historical district. It is like downtown of Kyiv. And I really haven't uh, heard uh, nothing with my own ears. Uh, and uh, it was really a difficult morning because um, no one tells you uh, what is the proper thing to do when the war comes to your country and uh, when it comes with uh, rockets uh, and uh, when it comes uh, with uh, a big danger across the whole country. And uh, I want to say about our team and the Ukrainian media, uh, we got ready uh, for the war because uh, we had uh, a lot of trainings with journalists that work at war uh, and uh, we had uh, trainings uh, to learn uh, something about the first aid and so on. Uh, but uh, the only thing I did uh, to get prepared for this war uh, was uh, making order with my documents and uh, just uh, now it is funny thing to me because uh, there were uh, different dates uh, when the war uh, was to start. And one of them was uh, the 16th of February and it was the anniversary of my grandfather. And he lives in Lviv together with my parents. And of course, I went to Lviv to um, uh, meet this birthday together with him and my family. Uh, and the only thing uh, I thought about was like, um, uh, oh, if only the war didn't start so I can get back to Kiev, to my home. And uh, when you remember such things uh, now, after two months of the full-scale invasion, uh, it's just like a funny story. But um, another thing that uh, I remember well from that uh, first day, uh, we decided that uh, we go to Lviv, uh, to Western Ukraine. And we understand, understood that uh, we have kind of a couple of hours to do something. Uh, and what we decided to do is to, uh, was to collect uh, our library into big boxes. We wanted to take uh, big boxes from uh, the post office, Nova Post and New Post, which operates in Ukraine, because we knew that everything will be closed in Kyiv. But uh, the two things were opened. Uh, our favorite uh, coffee, Sweet cover the world of coffee, and they greeted us there with coffee. Uh, the war started, but they still understood that they want to make coffee. And the other was the new post, and we bought uh, a lot of boxes uh, to collect the books because we didn't know if we managed to come back to Kyiv, and uh, we wanted to somehow try to make our library safe. But uh, uh, what the day uh, taught uh, me, uh, I dare say that. Uh, it taught me that uh, important, uh, there are not really very important things that you take with you when you flee your home. Uh, you uh, take uh, the important person with your hand, you take your kids, your loved ones. But of course, when the time passes, you uh, think about your home and you think about all those things that uh, uh, give you your intellectual and mental space and uh, um, every day I think about that intellectual space that was lost about uh, uh, that was lost by uh, a lot of citizens of Ukraine because uh, they needed to leave their homes and uh, for example I uh, have a real chance uh, to come back to my library but uh, a lot of people from eastern Ukraine or from the north of Ukraine uh, they don't have this chance because their library is destroyed. And for example, uh, 
Ukrainian writer Oleksandr Mehet, who used to live in Bucha, has his library destroyed, and uh, they, uh, with his wife, uh, came to Bucha to save uh, some remains of the library. Uh, but of course, it is not about the books, it is not about the physical objects, but it is about uh, something more uh, that we had and uh, that we lose. And it is really a distinctive feature for the Ukrainian history because we lose uh, those uh, emotional but also intellectual objects of our memory uh, so many times. Uh, so to finish it up, I really hope that uh, I will manage to come back to my library uh, and uh, that uh, I will remember that very first day of the war uh, not as a day of a loss only, but also as a day of the beginning of something. Uh, I think you make a really good point, Bogdana, about this intellectual space. I uh, had this feeling myself. I, my husband and I gave our apartment to refugees from Kharkiv, and uh, I described going back to, to my apartment to get books, because, of course, on the first day, we took clothes, documents, this and I wanted to take a book. So I took a, a book about uh, Paul Ceylon and I stopped and I thought, uh, will this book uh, save me from getting murdered? Will it save me from getting raped? Uh, and and I, it was quite a tragedy to understand that these things that were so dear to us, um, we have almost the guilt that uh, these things uh, do not become as urgent to us as they were before. Uh, Norman, uh, could you tell me, please, what it's been like to see with the Ukrainian diaspora? Um, I, because you, Canada has the largest uh, population of Ukrainian diaspora in the world. I'm sure it's been quite painful for all of you to, to watch everything from afar. And, and how have you, uh, how have you, um, how have you felt about the response? What is, what have you seen? How has the community mobilized to help Ukraine? Uh, microphone. Uh, Norman, your microphone, you have to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. First, I just want to say I'm honored and humbled to be here in the presence of writers in Ukraine who are right now, because of their tremendous courage uh, and perseverance, are, are there under fire with air raid sirens going off and taking shelter and participating in this event. And my, my heart goes out to you. Um, it was very hard. It was very hard for us to watch thousands of miles away, um, to hear about friends and family and to watch the news. Uh, when the war started that first day, because of the time difference, we are seven hours ahead of you, behind you. We got the news first. And I was already online watching the news, reading in the days, the weeks leading up to the war trying to figure out what's actually going on. And it was terrifying, the possibility, but also the moment it happened, it was unbelievable. Like I was speechless, I was shocked that, oh my God, it's actually happening. The Americans had been warning that this war is gonna happen. We don't believe what the American government says. We never trust what the American government says. We've learned that, but here the war started. I have friends in Canada who actually called their relatives directly, woke them up and said, the war has started, get to safety. So we in Canada knew before people in Ukraine that, that the war had started because we were all awake. We were all watching the news. The response since then uh, has been unbelievable. I've never seen such an outpouring of support, uh, such a recognition. Uh, of Ukraine, Ukrainian people, uh, such an outpouring of compassion, of, of, of concrete support, raising money to send to Ukraine for medical aid, for humanitarian aid. Uh, Ukrainian flags are everywhere, uh, coast to coast in Canada. People are having fundraisers on a weekly basis, dance events, music events, poetry events, theater events, raising money, raising public awareness among non-Ukrainian Canadians. But within the Ukrainian community in Canada, this support has been 100%, 200%. And with among other Canadians who were not Ukrainians, there is an incredible amount of interest now that this has precipitated 
interest in Ukrainian history, in Ukrainian culture, in Ukrainian music, in Ukrainian literature, in Ukrainian geography. Um, in schools, children are now learning about Ukraine. This never happened before. Uh, students are writing papers on Ukraine. Uh, stores have displays of Ukrainian goods and Ukrainian clothes, you name it. It's, it's just been, people have been touched, people have been moved, and people are actually going to Ukraine as doctors, as nurses, as volunteers to help in whatever way possible. So that's what's happened. And uh, it's interesting what you say about this interest in uh, Ukrainian culture, because I, my impression has always been that the Ukrainian diaspora, while they are quite proud and uh, always like willing to display their heritage, there is almost this kind of gap that exists between Ukrainian culture in Ukraine and in the diaspora, linguistically. Uh, also, uh, as I've noticed, working, uh, I, I work, uh, I'm involved with the translator collective TOLP, Tompkins Agency for Ukrainian Literature and Translation, and uh, a lot of diaspora uh, are uh, joining as translators, and it's quite interesting who they are aware of in contemporary literary scene. For some of them, the most modern thing can be like Lina Kostenko, and they are very interested in Ivan Franko, Taras Shevchenko, uh, Lesa Ukrainka. So I want to ask Norman, uh, do you feel that there is a gap, and do you think that this uh, invasion, as horrible as it is, can be a way that that gap, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, is, is started to be bridged between Ukrainian diaspora and uh, Ukraine, especially when it comes to literature and culture. Sure, but it's a typical gap, whether you're Italian, you're Chinese, uh, whoever, wherever you're from in the world, the diaspora, it's always, there's a gap. It, it's just commonplace. But now because of what's happened, yes, people have come together, artists have come together. I'm meeting Ukrainian artists I didn't know existed in the city of Montreal, in the city of Vancouver, musicians, writers, poets, actors. I didn't know them, you know, never had a chance before to meet. People are coming together and sharing experience, information and visions about what more can we do to help in Ukraine. So yes, slowly that gap is being narrowed and with the influx of new Ukrainians all the time, and now Canada is welcoming like 44,000 Ukrainian refugees, which is a lot of people. With that, I'm positive there's going to be an influx of ideas, of experience, of, of art, of creativity, which will help bridge, narrow that gap. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bogdana and you have both uh, traveled abroad. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the uh, cultural gaps between diaspora and Ukraine? Um, I see that Bogdana is unmuted at this moment. Uh, you, you have to... Uh, press it on, on your computer. So I, I wouldn't call it a uh, gap. I would speak about uh, some differences. Uh, but for me, the word gap is uh, too, too strong in, in, in that context. Uh, um, I'm also not, uh, not convinced, uh, Kate, uh, that uh, you are absolutely right if you say that uh, Ukrainian di diaspora readers know just uh, the, the newest name that they know is Lina Kostenko's name. I, I would say there are different, very different people. Oh, sorry, it's like a joke. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, it's, it, it was a very good, a very witty joke, but uh, you provoked me. To uh, to this answer. So uh, actually my Canadian experience is not so uh, huge, but uh, the cities I have visited in Canada was, uh, it, it was uh, geographically composed in the way I, I was uh, traveling uh, from east uh, to the west, more and more and more to the west. It, it was in 2018. And uh, I started by Toronto, and then I was in Winnipeg, 
uh, then in uh, Edmonton. And I finished uh, on the island uh, Victoria, uh, island uh, Vancouver, sorry, in, in Victoria. Uh, so uh, it was absolutely different in uh, each of these places. Uh, one can say that um, uh, Toronto is a very special city and maybe they are uh, they are, so to speak, most advanced uh, in uh, contemporary Ukrainian literature. Uh, they uh, actually, uh, I, I met uh, my old friends uh, in Toronto uh, who, um, which I, I met for the first time in the 90s. And uh, there was a very, very active um, uh, artistic, uh, you can call it group or uh, maybe artistic environment uh, of younger uh, Ukrainian uh, writers and uh, artists and musicians. And they published, for example, a very interesting a magazine called Terminus. Uh, they had a, a theater uh, and they tried to stage some avant-garde. And uh, so they, they published a lot of uh, their texts written in Ukrainian, uh, but also in English. Uh, and uh, they followed uh, every new uh, name every new book uh, published in Ukraine uh, at the end of 80s and then in 1990s. So I had uh, the contacts with them and uh, after many years we didn't see each other. I was very glad to, to meet them in Toronto and uh, so we had some nice conversations and uh, it it does it didn't look to me like they you know like like they are absolutely somewhere beyond of uh, topical ukrainian situation in our literature but uh, my experience in winnipeg uh, was uh, quite different and, uh, but you know, in Edmonton, the next my station in Edmonton, there is a Ukrainian Institute. And so they discover uh, the newest uh, phenomena of uh, Ukrainian culture too. But yes, I, I, I noted they, they are mostly, they deal with uh, Ukrainian history. Uh, they, they have some uh, strong um, historic uh, accent there. But um, of course, uh, this is just uh, the, uh, let's call it uh, the, 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 uh, some group of uh, leaders uh who deal with uh ukrainian uh so to speak professionally and uh, i hope that uh, as a result one of the most positive results of uh, this invasion uh we will get the possibility to communicate uh, um, much more often and uh, more intensive. And uh, we can have a very good cultural exchange between our country, especially uh, as I read in the news that Canada and Ukraine are going to, to uh, establish uh, a visa-free regime for Ukrainian citizens uh, to visit Canada without any visa. Uh, it, it will be a huge step 
to uh, our um, future uh, better better uh, collaborations and uh, understanding. Uh, thank you for that good point. Bogdana, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, I have been uh, to uh, French speaking Canada uh, uh, at Montreal Book Fair, and uh, there were things that really surprised me. It was 2019, and I realized that uh, Canadians really understand Ukrainians. Uh, when I'm speaking about that, uh, I mean uh, Canadians uh, who work professionally with the uh, industry of literature, uh, so presses and literary agents. And what do I mean? Uh, that um, Canadians, especially French-speaking can uh, Canadian uh, writers, uh, they understood uh, what is uh, to be a part of underrepresented literature because they have uh, rich poetry, rich fiction, uh, they have a, a great history and so on, like we Ukrainians also have. And uh, they just understand our context. And there are a lot of Ukrainian presses who uh, work really fruitfully with uh, Canadian authors and uh, translate the contemporary Canadian authors and not only French speaking, uh, French writing, but also English writing. Um, I'm really very into that uh, idea that uh, Yuri told, and uh, I just want to ask about my uh, newest experience. Uh, yesterday, I took a book uh, of uh, the letters between uh, George Slutsky and Omelian Presak, uh, and uh, they both uh, are uh, well known uh, scholars of the Ukrainian studies. George Slutsky worked uh, at Toronto, and Omelian Presak was the head of Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Uh, and uh, uh, when I speak about George Slutsky, there is one thing that uh, comes uh, to my mind, uh, that he was the first person uh, to uh, have a dissertation about the executive renaissance, about the Ukrainian avant-garde literature, uh, and uh, about the Stalin's politics and how it influenced Ukrainian literature in 20th century. Uh, and it really inspires me because uh, when everybody liked uh, the USSR politics and uh, thought that USSR was among the allies who saved the world, uh, George Slutsky decided that uh, he must uh, to uh, give some light to this story. And uh, I just imagine uh, this uh, idea in the uh, Russian and Soviet studies of the 60s, 70s years uh, and uh, how difficult it was uh, to propose that idea. Uh, but uh, why George Lutsky uh, decided to do so, just how I think. Um, uh, he writes in his memoir uh, that uh, he understood that uh, he must uh, uh, fix uh, this uh, history and to show the world this terror. And uh, he understood uh, that the English speaking audience uh, just uh, don't know that there are, for example, uh, dozens and hundreds of the Ukrainian writers and uh, the best actors of Ukrainian cultures, uh, uh, culture uh, that uh, were just uh, shot because there was the anniversary of Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, uh, if uh, George Lutsky wasn't from uh, uh, Ukrainian diaspora, uh, he was from my home city, from Lviv, and uh, if he hadn't the, uh, this experience of uh, Ukrainians around him. Uh, his father was also a famous Ukrainian uh, uh, poet, uh, modernist poet, Ostapovsky. Uh, so he just uh, knew the context and uh, he managed uh, to present uh, those contexts uh, to the uh, English speaking audience. And uh, I think it is uh, really very important uh, to um, also to remember about uh, all those people. Uh, who worked for Ukraine in the 20th uh, century uh, because uh, they saved a lot uh, and uh, they even uh, saved uh, such things uh, that uh, they managed uh, to bring back in the 90s uh, after the uh, independence of Ukraine and uh, these are the work, uh, the memoir, but also the agenting uh, for Ukraine. Uh, of course, uh, sometimes uh, we can uh, see uh, the um, sentiment uh, for the traditional culture or sentiment uh, to uh, some cultural cliches. 
uh, but I also really uh, hope uh, that uh, now there will be uh, much more space uh, for the contemporary Ukrainian culture, uh, just because uh, everybody uh, is interested in uh, what Ukrainian culture is nowadays, uh, and uh, probably it uh, definitely will uh, narrow uh, all the gaps uh, or uh, all the um, space uh, that in, uh, isn't uh, uh, filled with the contemporary Ukrainian culture, uh, because we just have a lot of stories to share. And uh, if we didn't have such stories, uh, I wouldn't be so positive. Uh, but I think that it is a time to tell them, and uh, also to diaspora. Yeah. And uh, I, I like this point that you made about the work of Ukrainian diaspora to help preserve culture. I know that um, it was the New York School of Ukrainian Writers, I believe, who were translating Vasil Stus's work uh, when he was uh, imprisoned. And um, even today, there's a very interesting, and maybe Norman can talk a little bit more about this, uh, a very kind of distinct literary spheres taking shape shape there, which uh, based on uh, what both Bogdan and Yuri have said, it can be more interesting in coming years to see how these two very distinct, or not even two, it's many different spheres will, will mix. Uh, in New York, even today, for our viewers, there is a uh, Ukrainian poet Vasil Makhno, who is very interesting. He is originally from Ternopil region. Uh, he's been living in New York for almost 10 years, and a lot of his work uh, until recently was about being Ukrainian in New York. Uh, so Norman, uh, you have uh, written plays and uh, music and uh, uh, poetry, I believe, as well. Uh, could you talk about the like your work very briefly and the like Ukrainian diaspora literary scene in 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 your area? Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I I live in Montreal, even though I'm in Vancouver right now. Um, and my family emigrated to Canada in 1900, and settled on the prairies of Canada and around Winnipeg, Uri, so that, that entire area. And my family were peasants. They came from the Ternopolska Oblast, so not far from Chernovitsi, not far from where Yuri lives, Ivan Francis. So just south of Ternopil, north of Chernovitsi, west of Kamyets Podietsky. That's where my family roots are, my ancestors. And when they came, they were peasants, they were uneducated, they brought the music, they brought food, they brought the Vishavankas. They were not literate people. They were the first part of the first wave of immigrants. So in 1900, there wasn't much Ukrainian literature. There were Ukrainian poets, Canadian poets, hyphenated, because we're hyphenated people. We're Ukraine, I'm Polish hyphen Ukrainian hyphen Canadian. And that affects how we perceive the world, how we see ourselves, where does the Canadian stop? Where does the Ukrainian begin? What does it mean to be Ukrainian Canadian in a hyphenated society where you know, there are 50 nationalities that live together? The literature started off slowly in the early 20th century. Ukrainian writers in Canada writing in Ukrainian as well as in English, writing about their experience as farmers, as peasants, because that's what they were brought to Canada to do. They were invited by Canada to come here, to settle the land, to, um, well, to work in the factories, in the mines, on, on the fields, on the railways, dirty, dangerous, hard work, underpaid, exploited. And they wrote about those experiences. And in successive waves of Ukrainian immigrants coming to Canada, they were better educated, they were more literate, and they were able to write about those experiences. The previous generation wasn't. They just told their stories, sang them in songs, possibly acted out someplace, wrote some little theater pieces. There were reading halls all across Canada, Ukrainian reading halls, Ukrainian community halls, labor temples, where people tried to collect Ukrainian literature to teach the history, to teach the literature, to teach the culture. And in my family, for example, the stories were passed on through the generations, but nobody wrote them down. And it was only much later, like in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, when there was a renewed interest in, we must talk about ourselves as Ukrainian Canadians. We must write about our experiences, not just as peasants and farmers, but as people in the cities experiencing what we as Ukrainian Canadians experience, the racism, the discrimination, all that kind of stuff as well. And that nourished a new literature. 
Today in Canada, Yuri, you know, there are many Ukrainian Canadian authors who are amazing people who've won awards, who've published over, who's had their works translated, who compile Ukrainian Canadian literature and poetry. And there's been like an incredible renewal of interest, as I say, in the last decades. And now today, this will precipitate an even greater leap into our literature, into our poetry, into theater and music. Um, and that will nourish the culture that's here in the diaspora. So I'm seeing younger and younger Ukrainians better educated than ever before, now teaching in universities and colleges and teaching Ukrainian literature. We never learned about Ukrainian literature or history in the schools. There were no courses in the universities. The literary academia did not respect our lived experiences in this country. Our history was never taught. I never knew about Ukrainian literature until much later in life that, oh my God, there are books written about our history, about our people. And so that has fueled renewed interest today. That the generations, the waves of immigration, the generations that are better educated, more literate, and the exchanges between Ukraine and Canada, they're happening slowly, <laughs> you know, we get the music, we get Dakrabara, Dakrabara, da Dakra <laughs> and the daughters of Dakra are now coming to Canada. So this is, this is exciting people who aren't Ukrainian Canadian and, you know, inspiring more curiosity about who are these people? What is this culture? How is this really a thousand years old? Oh, I didn't know about this. Um, things are slowly changing. And as I said, artists are coming together now to raise money and we're trying to brainstorm, how can we help you? How can we help Ukrainian writers? How can we help Ukrainians there? What can we do concretely? That's a big question that now people are starting to talk about. And I'll be curious to hear your responses, please. What actually can we do to help you now? Uh, before we move on, uh, Bogdana, Yuri, what can, what can they do? <laughs> what do you think? I might start this time. Um, uh, I dare say that uh, the only thing Ukrainian culture needs is just uh, uh, much interest uh, to it, uh, because uh, it is a, a rich, interesting culture as any other uh, national cultures. And uh, there is a lot uh, to explore. And uh, not only contemporary culture, but for example we have a very beautiful uh, modernist culture but uh, i also enjoy the baroque epoch uh, in ukraine and uh, they are very different uh, they are very interesting and uh, they have a lot of cultural phenomena and artifacts uh, to uh, get and to read and to watch uh, so uh, the only thing is uh, to uh, um, to admit uh, that there is a big culture of uh, 40 million people and uh, because of uh, the history uh, and first of all because of the history of Russian aggression against Ukraine uh, for the centuries, uh, this culture was uh, banned, uh, sometimes abandoned, uh, sometimes forgotten. Uh, because uh, for Ukrainians, uh, Lesa Ukrainka is uh, one of the uh, main uh, modernist writers, and it is very important that uh, she is a, a female writer. Uh, but uh, if we uh, look at her uh, from the imperialist point of view, we understand uh, that uh, she is uh, unfortunately just a writer of the national minority of Russian Empire. And in the times when uh, there were uh, writers uh, from uh, Europe nominated uh, for the Nobel Prize uh, in Literature, uh, people like Lesya Ukrainka uh, had really a small chance to be awarded with such prizes and uh, to be wide translated and uh, to see their plays um, put on the stage uh, at uh, different theaters uh, just because uh, they were perceived like a persons uh, from national minority and uh, now is uh, time uh, to change that and uh, it is time uh, to uh, decolonize Ukrainian culture uh, for the uh, foreign uh, 
reader for the foreign listener uh, because we just uh, have a lot uh, of stories to share. Uh, so I, I just encourage our listeners uh, to uh, Google the uh, books they can read, uh, to uh, Google the movies they can watch uh, on Netflix, uh, and uh, uh, to open this uh, big world uh, to themselves. Mm -hmm. So, because we are running uh, out of time, I just wanted to have an open question to all of you. Uh, where do you think that uh, Ukrainian literature, culture, language goes from here in this time of war? Uh, Bogdana made this very important point about uh, decolonizing uh, literature. And I, I uh, know from trying to get Ukrainian authors published, it has been a bit of a challenge because any text that um, uh, for example, a text from a young writer, Markian Prohasko, you can see on Epophany, uh, my magazine that we published. It was deemed controversial uh, by many editors of edgy, so-called so edgy literary magazines, where basically he says that uh, the Russian culture was built on lies without that it wouldn't exist. But Ukrainian culture is like the phoenix from the ashes. And it really was a quite... Uh, if, eloquently put break, uh, so to speak. And I would recommend, of course, for our viewers, uh, Yuri's novel, The Muscoviad, which is uh, one of his earlier pieces, which is uh, in translation, thanks to Vitaly Chernetsky. It's quite a phantasmagoric uh, exploration of one day in the life of Ukrainian writer, who is, uh, as the novel starts in Moscow, maybe Yuri would like to say a few words about it. So um, another thing I want to say is that, uh, no, we really have to emphasize, I, I think, uh, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts, how deep this goes. Uh, I, a student of French literature, uh, was kind of saddened to discover that uh, Anaré du Balzac, one of my former favorite writers, was traveling in the Russian Empire, uh, specifically in the uh, territory of modern-day Ukraine. And if you read his travelogues, he is a fanboy of Tsar Nicholas II, basically, and he is saying that how great other empires would be if they are like Russia, and uh, that he is looking at Ukrainians as little peasants, basically. And this is the same time that Taras Shevchenko is uh, able to come back to Ukraine, the same time that Taras Shevchenko is writing uh, poems like Katerina, where he warns um, where he is warning uh, Ukrainian girls uh, don't fall in love with the uh, Maskali because they will not treat you right. Uh, so yeah, that is all to sum up and say, where do we see uh, literature going from here? Uh, right now, the West is quite interested in Ukraine in terms of war. How do we show Ukraine, uh, the world that uh, Ukraine, uh, no, that a surrealist novel is just as interesting, right? Uh, but also how do we affirm this Ukrainian identity with a clear break from the Russian imperial culture uh, when it's for some people in the West controversial because they are talking about Russophobia and things like this. So yeah, that's an open question to all three of you, whoever would like to start. Um, if I may, I, I, I will uh, start by answering to your Previous question: mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> What Canada can do for us, uh, for Ukraine, and and maybe I come then to to the next point to, to your uh, newest newer question. Uh, so I my my favorite idea would be uh, just. Uh, send your people to Ukraine. I mean, uh, we still have a big lack of, uh, of the good translators of contemporary Ukrainian literature. Uh, so the, the, the number uh, of the people uh, who are very gifted in uh, literature and who know Ukrainian language uh, on the level they can uh, absolutely successfully translate uh, this. Uh, sometimes uh, the texts are very complicated, but who can translate them successfully 
into English or maybe in Canadian uh, case also in French. Uh, so it, it's a very, very low, this number. There are just very few. And uh, I would say uh, it would be a very good project, uh, some kind of uh, cooperation uh, between Ukraine as a state and Canada as a state. Uh, cooperation in creating some uh, programs uh, which allow uh, some Canadian uh, future translators of Ukrainian literature to come to Ukraine to spend some months and probably years in our country to fall in love with Ukraine and uh, to help us to understand ourselves better and uh, to study Ukrainian in all the meanings, in, in uh, all the possible contexts, because they are very, very important uh, for translating of contemporary Ukrainian literature to see many, many contexts. And uh, post-colonial one is, of course, uh, just the base of everything. And I suspect that this work will change a lot of things uh, in, in also in the context. I, I can just uh, uh, remember just one example of uh, my today's reality, which is, uh, you know, is always uh, the kind of communication with the Western journalists, with media uh, from Italy, Spain, uh, France, Germany, and so on. And uh, many journalists are interested in the question of humor. How is the situation with humor in that time of war? And it's a very, very right, very, very appropriate question, because uh, I think we, we, all, uh, we, we, we are absolutely in a time of flourishing black humor now. We have a lot of jokes, but, but we need some real translators for them, because I, I, I never can deliver these jokes uh, with my English uh, to the Western journalists. Because if, if you start to explaining the joke, uh, showing what, what the humor there is, uh, the joke is just canceled, it's just uh, lost. And so it's just a very small, very tiny example of uh, the real uh, perspective of what can be done in the meaning of uh, learning of language and learning of society and uh, uh, and and uh, probably the uh, the number of uh, the translators who can translate uh, Ukrainian literature into English uh, can be bigger. Um, and now I would go to your newest question, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, I, I forget uh, the, the, the plot. Uh, you, you kind of started to answer it. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, my question was, uh, in a short uh, term, where does Ukrainian literature go from here? Because we have a lot of people interested in Ukraine in the context of war. And mm -hmm. uh, although historically that has uh, unfortunately been the case in terms of Russian aggression, uh, how, mm -hmm. how do we, uh, how does Ukrainian literature show that some sensual surrealist novel is just as interesting as a novel about uh, war, for example? Oh, I, I, I am I'm afraid there is no uh, recipes. There are no recipes for that because it's, it's always a big mystery of each literary work. 
how uh, is it written, it's always a mystery. It's always a question of uh, to be or not to be. So <laughs> the, 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 the could be there could be some uh, genius text, but you never know how uh, how it will be perceived by uh, the readers in other country, especially if the translation uh, is uh, is completely appropriate, uh, but in some details it is weaker than original. And then this uh, essence of uh, literary miracle uh, is lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you just uh, discuss uh, the story without discussing of something which lies beyond the story and which is in each literary work more important than the story uh, as such. Uh, but you also mentioned Russophobia, so we, uh, uh, or Russophilia maybe. Uh, so we actually, we are, we in, in Ukraine as Ukrainian writers, uh, we, we were the long time, we were, so to speak, in the shadow of uh, big Russian literature. And uh, it is in a kind, you know, some uh, audience, uh, some uh, international audience uh, uh, perceives the being a Russian writer and uh, as a kind of uh, uh, absolute high literary quality. Uh, you have not to defend somehow the, the high quality of your writing if you are Russian writer. You are just like a representative of some Dostoevsky or something, and you are like a continuator of the big literary tradition. And uh, you also have a lot of brilliant translators from Russian. So you, you are absolutely privileged in that case. And Ukrainian writer doesn't have this uh, privileges. Uh, so we, we have to persuade uh, the publishers and literary audience that uh, this novel or maybe uh, this collection of poems uh, is really beautiful. You you have to publish it, uh, and and then uh, we have this kind of uh, um, of um, confrontation, uh, which we actually we, we don't want to be uh, always in the context of something Russian, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they are not Russian; they are Ukrainians they say, but of course, uh, it, it is not normal thing to uh, build uh, somebody's position just in a context of somebody else. And uh, so it's a problem which, uh, of course, we, we are the witnesses now of uh, Mm, the time uh, when this uh, this situation will be changed. Uh, it is not about uh, some collapse of uh, this, uh, let's call it religion, religion, uh, believing into big and high Russian literature, but maybe uh, we slowly come, we approach uh, to the situation as we, uh, or personally me, as Ukrainian right, uh, will be considered as a very autonomous entity without mm -hmm. any uh, suppositions, confrontations, contexts, 
with Russians. And if some wider context than just Ukrainian one, then maybe Central European, maybe this is the same context like uh, Polish or Hungarian authors, or maybe Czech uh, writers, uh, or maybe the German writers, Austrian writers. So there are many, many, many other cultures and languages in the world, uh, not just the Russian. And uh, I, I say it without any Russophobia, but of course, uh, uh, somebody can perceive it as a, a kind of Russophobia I formulated now. Uh, Bogdana, uh, Norman, would you like to add anything else before we uh, open up to questions? Uh, I should add for our viewers that um, I published on Epophany a very interesting interview with Bogdana recently about um, Ukrainian uh, cultural institutions calls to suspend cooperation with Russian artists during the time of war and why this is not Russophobia, as some people would uh, say. And uh, Bogdana very eloquently explained uh, this uh, Ukrainian cause. And I encourage you all to, to read it, to share it. And yeah, so let's, uh, I guess we can end on that. Uh, Lori, are there any questions uh, before we finish? Yes, we have a couple of questions and comments. Um, but I just want to say first that uh, Afrina has just put into the chat a couple of organizations, well, one organization that uh, I had asked Kate for a recommendation. If you do want to do something more, if you're inspired by this event to do something uh, financial, uh, an organization that Kate recommends, um, and also a link to the Ukrainians, which is the uh, journal that Bahdana edits. Um, I've also put into the chat um, the name of a I, someone shared with us, Jim Olwell shared with us during the event that Yuri has had a poem translated into English in the April 7th issue of the New York Review of Books. And I add also that Kate has an article in the uh, dated March 30th in the New Yorker, why I chose to stay in your Ukraine. I've already read that one. It's very moving and I recommend that to you. Um, one of the people who wrote has asked us for more recommendations um, to be put into the chat. I think what would be more effective is if you're willing, all of you, to send us a few things, uh, suggestions for sort of a, a starter package, a little kit of where to start reading Ukrainian literature in translation, then we can send that out to everyone who was in attendance or even all those who registered for this webinar. Um, let's see, uh, Diana says a comment to say that I am like Norman, Canadian, Ukrainian, Polish, and a writer born in Winnipeg. I feel today's conversation is an important inroad toward building more links between writers, poets, translators in Ukraine, and for the sake of this context, the Canadian diaspora. I haven't witnessed too many, uh, sorry, yeah, I haven't witnessed too many of them. Thank you all so much for sharing your experiences at this time and for this conversation. So that's a, a comment. Um, we did have a question about where you all are. I think you mentioned the names of your cities, most of you, but maybe uh, you could just give us a better, better idea of of exactly what city you're in and where where you are in the country. Um, I'll start, I guess. I'm in Chernivtsi. Uh, it's close to the borders of uh, Romania and Moldova. And um, we uh, actually, before the start of the event, uh, there was a red siren uh, in uh, Bogdana and Yuri's cities, but it's not here. So as uh, Yuri was saying before the event, that Chernivtsi is quite a privileged space sometimes, uh, which is true. And actually people in Chernivtsi joke, um, if we talk about dark humor, uh, that uh, ah, Russians don't know about Chernivtsi, they think it's Romania. <laughs> the first time we are happy that nobody cares about us. Yeah. <laughs> Bogdana? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm in Lviv. It is Western Ukraine and it is close to Polish border. And it is also my native city where I have lived till my 20s. Uh, so I feel here like uh, at home. Uh, but uh, I hope to 
uh, come back to Kiev in the nearest time. Yes, I, I invited Bogdana to speak before me because I'm exactly in the middle of the road between uh, Bogdana and Kate, uh, because uh, my city of ivano frankivsk is located between Lviv and Chernivtsi. Uh, and this is exactly the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is my native city. Uh, in my life, uh, I was always uh, traveling a lot, but I never changed uh, the place uh, where I live. I, I uh, found it as a good idea to be a traveler, to spend a lot of time on the road, but uh, to come back, uh, always to be back uh, at the place uh, where you feel just uh, home you are home and uh, it's important for me uh, to get some new experiences traveling to get some impulses some ideas and then to to uh, to write uh, being home uh, to to fulfill these uh, plans and um, ideas so i'm here uh now uh, actually uh, from the very beginning of the war but uh, because there was a time i was uh, uh pendling between my city and uh, capital and kiev in january and uh, the beginning of february uh, we made uh, with my friends and colleagues we, we made an audio book uh uh after my newest novel radio night and uh my, my novel they called it uh acoustic novel acoustic novels so sounding so it was very important to prepare this uh, audio book with uh, different voices and different uh, sounds in there and uh, it's uh, of course impossible to imagine now that uh, this audio book uh, will be published uh, during the war. I don't think it will be a good idea because uh, we, all, we all can understand there are many, many, many more important uh, news now. Uh, but I hope that uh, maybe in the, in the very first day uh, after the war, after our victory, uh, we can discuss then the, the terms of uh, publishing of this audio book. Thank you. Um, Catherine has asked you, Kate, to repeat where your interview with Bachdana is. I believe that's in your journal, Apof Yeah, Apof uh, Apofani. And the title of the interview is that um, Ukrainians know that the Russian liberal ends where the question of Ukraine begins. It's a famous quote uh, from uh, class, uh, um, 20th century Ukrainian writer Volodymyr Vinichenko. Uh, so you can learn a lot uh, about this question of Ukraine uh, asserting itself uh, away from this Russian influence and because Bogdana is really eloquent and I encourage all to read it. I don't have this in front of me right now, so I'm going to check it before I hit enter and put it in the chat, but it's A-P-O-F-E-N-I-E. A-P-O-F-E-N-I-E, yes, Apophenie. Okay, I just put it in, not a link, you can find it yourselves online, uh, but that's where that is. Okay, great. Um, Dominique uh, writes, I recently read Olesya Yaremchuk's wonderful book, Our Others. I have also read a great deal of the development of a Ukrainian civic identity in the last several years across ethnic lines. I'm wondering if there is a sense of Ukrainian literature that includes Ukraine's diversity, the writing of the Crimean, Tartars, Paul Celan, Yiddish writers, etc. I know that the Ukrainian language literature, oh sorry, I know that Ukrainian language literature is still struggling for recognition on its own terms, but I'm still wondering. I may start and uh, tell a bit, uh, uh, just like an example about the Crimean Tatars literature. 
uh, it is represented in Ukraine and uh, a lot was done uh, since the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, there is uh, a contest uh, called, um, I forgot the name of the contest, uh, but uh, it is uh, performed by the Crimean House, which is a state-run uh, agency in Ukraine, and it supports the uh, literature written in the Crimean Tatar language. And uh, we have short stories, uh, but also poetry. And uh, what is important for me as a reader and as a cultural manager, a person who works with this literature, is uh, that uh, we have a lot of this uh, different ethnical uh, topics uh, in our literature, also in Ukrainian uh, language. Uh, so uh, it is represented uh, in the novels, in the poetry, and uh, we see uh, Ukraine as a, a diverse and uh, open culture, which uh, also, uh, which always was uh, open uh, to uh, different national minorities uh, who lived uh, here in Ukraine. And uh, even there are a lot of contemporary novels uh, which uh, show us uh, how it looked like uh, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Of course, it changed uh, after the world wars and uh, after the politics of the Soviet regime. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, this literature is represented. And so I, I can just uh, say that uh, the big names of uh, uh, Paul Celan or Bruno Schulz, uh, they are connected to uh, Ukraine um, quite directly because of the places uh, where they uh, where they spent uh, important parts of their lives but also uh, not just them, but uh, they are the highest too. I, I would say they are the most uh, famous and they are really the, the world names, uh, Celan and Schulz. And they also became to the very important uh, actors of contemporary Ukrainian literary process. Uh, during the translations, uh, both from Celan and from Schulz, uh, and reading th them, both of them, in Ukrainian. Uh, Ukrainian uh, literary community uh, gets a lot of uh, the universal experience and uh, absolutely uh, organically uh, uh, takes them into, into, so to speak, heart and body of uh, uh, Ukrainian culture. And it is, it is, of course, important in the meaning that uh, uh, Celan and Schulz and uh, Deborah Vogel and uh, maybe Joseph Roth, all of them uh, are uh, the persons uh, from this uh, historic cultural uh, area called uh, Central Eastern Europe. So uh, Ukraine gets this uh, perspective thanks to them and to, to the work working with their heritage, Ma making the heritage uh, alive and very topical, very uh, very tremendous in uh, our today's uh, souls and minds. Uh, I'm sorry for the darkness. I, I barely <laughs> I just, see myself there. I was just uh, going to say the next, the, the next the, comment. There was just uh, glasses for some orientation. <laughs> Maybe I take them again. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just going to say, Yuri, the next comment, uh, as I was watching you get darker and darker, I was more <laughs> and more thinking that this is sort of, I think for many of us in Canada, unbelievable that we're sitting here while you are 
you know have yes gone because some... yeah they they recommend us uh, not to to switch the lights uh, during this alarm which is as you see quite long so it's uh, more than one hour yeah. but okay yes if if you can uh, somehow tolerate my uh my, my darkness here uh then well uh, we're, we're, continue. we're tolerating we're tolerating your darkness and we're benefiting from your light as well <laughs> um, Thank you fact, very mark, much. one of our guests mark abley writes i'd just like to say that i am in awe of the courage the lucidity and the resilience of the panelists in ukraine Norman is wonderfully lucid too. <laughs> Solidarity <laughs> and humble thanks. That's from Mark Abley. Um, Roman Ivashkiv writes, Yuri is absolutely right about the need for more translators into English, but we also need translators who can bring more diasporic literature from Canada and other diasporic communities to Ukraine. Norman, thank you for your support. I'll try to reach out to you and learn more about your work. You all for the, uh, thank you all for this discussion. Bogdana and Yuri praying that you and your families are stay safe and I'm sure uh, Roman means Kate as well and hoping that Ukraine will prevail soon Slava Ukraini I don't Slava know if I said Ukraine. that right, <laughs> yeah. right. Um, actually uh, someone else had asked about work and and I think we should give Norman a minute to tell us also a little bit about some of his work that that you might want to look up of course just a few books here and there, novels, short stories, poetry, but specifically Ukrainian focused plays about Ukrainian immigrant experience here in Canada. So very briefly, 100 years ago, Canada invited poor Ukrainians come to Canada, leave Austro-Hungarian, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, leave the poverty, leave the oppression, uh, leave the persecution, come to Canada. We, this is the land of milk and honey. Well, it wasn't, <laughs> it was a big surprise. And so I write plays about my family's experience and coming to Canada in 1900, a series of plays, about how they were treated by the Canadian government, by the Anglo dominant majority here in Canada, how their culture was suppressed, how people changed their names so they could fit in and be accepted and be assimilated and actually get work because if you had a Ukrainian last name and you spoke with a Ukrainian accent, you wouldn't necessarily get work. You wouldn't be able to feed your family. You wouldn't be able to, to live as other Canadians who were English were able to. So I wrote a series of plays about this. And the, the most recent play was about how the government actually rounded up 9,000 Ukrainians in Canada, imprisoned them in 24 forced labor concentration camps across Canada, beat them, tortured them, and killed them, and called them enemy aliens. And very few people know this history. It's one of those dark chapters in Canadian history that people are slowly learning about. So I wrote a play about it, and 99% of the people who saw it said they had never heard this before. And so in my work, I try to educate people about unknown history of Ukrainian immigrants in the country. I also play the music, I wear the Vishavankos, you know, try to celebrate the, the positive, our contribution to, to Canada as Ukrainian Canadians. Uh, so that's what I do. Thank you, Norman. If, um, if I may ask you, I, I see here behind you, there is a beautiful guitar. Are you playing guitar? I play uh, violin. That's my sister. Yeah, my sister plays ukulele. Together we play oh, Ukrainian. Yeah. We play Ukrainian okay. music together and oh, we yeah. do benefits to raise money. We're playing benefits in Vancouver, played benefits in Montreal. We're playing benefits in Vancouver. Like I said, there's so much a demand now for Ukrainian culture so that they can mm. showcase the culture and raise money at the same time to send to Ukraine. Great, great. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of our time. Carol Thorpe writes, this will motivate me to follow up. Thank you, you are so brave. And Lynn Werner, who's a guest who lives in the US, uh, has written something that I think might be a sort of a, a way to ask each of you for a final statement, unless Kate has something specific she wants to ask. Lynn writes, I live in a small town of 3000 in Northwest Illinois, US. I'm giving a program tonight 
on the poetry of war at our public library with a focus on Ukrainian poetry. A fellow poet and I are reading Ukrainian poetry in translation, as well as some of our own. Do you have a short message that I might give to the audience or to those people tonight? And we can just go around. Anyone who has anything to offer. Um, if I may, I would I would say, let's stay together. We are facing a big evil now. Uh, the place where Ukraine is today is the place of uh, the big fight against evil. And so just uh, hope and believe uh, that we shall overcome. That's perfect. <laughs> we can't say better than that. <laughs> okay, another, I'm sorry, one more comment has come in then, uh, and we do have time. It's from Brian Demchinsky. I recommend a story in the New Yorker this month by a Ukrainian writer, Artem Chepaye. Chepai, yes. Chepai. Yes, there is, uh, there is. It's called The Ukraine, Beautiful Moving Story. And then a comment, what is happening in Ukraine is the worst tragedy Ukrainians have experienced since the Holodomar, but a small ray of light. People everywhere are now learning about the people who live in Ukraine, their strength, their courage, their ability to endure, and yes, their culture. Thank you, uh, Bob. If, if I could add real quickly, uh, Chepai's story, uh, it is part of a greater short story collection that, and it's the titular story. The whole one is called The Ukraine, and it was announced by his translator Zanya Tomkins today that the entire collection will be published by Seven Stories Press. There is even a beautiful cover. Uh, so uh, Chupai, uh, Artem Chupai is serving in the Ukrainian army right now. Uh, and he is um, a self-described pacifist, a really sweet guy. So I'm, uh, I'm really hoping that he and every other writer who is in the army right now will get to return to, to literature. And I'm really happy that Amer uh, English readers will get to discover his work very soon. Great. Well, I think uh, there are no more questions. So I will just take this last opportunity to thank you again so very much uh, for sharing your time with us, your thoughts, your, uh, your situation and your understanding of the situation between Ukraine and Canada. Um, it means a lot to us uh, that you were able to be with us here today. Um, and we would like to be able to continue uh, having some contact with you if that suits you as well. Uh, Kate, uh, I, I think, you know, if you can give us uh, a little list of some of the things that you recommended, everyone actually, and Kate, uh, your journal, people now have the name of it, but we'll add that to the list of what we send out. Uh, Bahadana, your, uh, your piece, your, uh, it's a journal also, I guess. Um, we'll put that into our information that we send out along with a link to this video and for those in the audience if you know people who you think ought to have been here today um, we hope you'll share the link to the video with them so that they can take it in on their own time and primarily we wish you uh thank you norman also um so much for doing this i know that it was a big ask uh, i know that you're a humble person and that you did not feel that that it was entirely appropriate for you to be on the same screen, but you brought a lot to this event. I think everybody will agree. Um, yes. But uh, more than anything else, Kate and Bachdana and Yuri, we we wish you that you stay safe, that your family stays safe, uh, that you keep writing, that you find a way back uh, to writing if you've had to take some time away, and uh, we'd like to stay in touch. So. Thank you thank all. You, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Afrina. Afrina? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it was a very, very good and unforgettable, this our conversation. Uh, I just say goodbye.
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.